Welcome to the podcast that discusses storytelling from all angles to help you and us answer the call when the muse screams, tell the damn story. We'll be exploring the challenges of being creative in fiction, illustration, comics, film, and nonfiction. All right, welcome back to another episode of Tell the Damn Story. Tonight, Are we doing that again? Yes, we're going to tell the damn story. It's just the two of us, though. Tim yeah. is out in the about in the wilds of America, uh, forging a blazing a trail for his yeah. um, for his comic book. He's not blazing saddles, yeah. Nope, nope. And uh, we wish him the best, and hopefully he'll get back soon. Um, but um, you know, Maddie's rocket is taking off. So God bless him. So yeah, uh, today I wanted to kind of we kind of have a potpourri going on here. Where we're going to catch up on a few things and talk about some um, some topics that were brought up uh, um, in a, a great review that Alex oh, wow. Simmons uh, enjoyed about the new publication of uh, Blackjack's Second Bite of the Cobra, which was your first yes. comic book outing, correct? Yes. Yeah. Well, no, actually. Um... It was my the first series that I created, printed in comic book form, um, that I published. Uh, I did something before that for Eclipse Comics. But was it, it the Demon Jack? Chronicles? No, no, it was the Demon Chronicles. The Demon Chronicles, sure. And right. at some point in some episode, we should talk about those things. But I'm I would like to because reworking it, yeah. Yes, but I'm I'm, I'm interested tonight about. Uh, focusing a little bit on Blackjack for a while, um, and the second bite of the Cobra, because uh, you've been getting good press on that, including yes, 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 um, yes. A, uh, a great review that, uh, first of all, let's, let's talk about the great comparison. It, would, it just swelled my heart with pride to read this uh, great paragraph that I'm urging you to, and I saw you did it uh, on a little meme. Hopefully you'll spread it out more. Um, but the reviewer listed all these classic characters, you know, uh, Prince Valiant, Long Ranger, Sherlock Holmes, James Bond, and and it was all leading up to Blackjack, and yeah, it was yeah. so appropriate, and you know, praise a uh, long time in coming. So congratulations on that. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and let me say it again, thank you. But in that. Um, in that review, if I could remember correctly, he also mentioned an interesting little fact um, that I want to explore for the first couple of minutes of this episode, if it's okay with you. Um, sure. He mentioned that um, Blackjack enjoys more reverence and more allegiance um, and more of a, a cult following overseas than it does in America. Um, would you say that's true? Well, um... It's interesting because I, I think I personally can't say that's true or not true. I can say that what did happen, uh, and we may have talked about this way back. I know you and I personally have talked about it because you've been a part of this adventure since the beginning. But um, when I was trying to pitch Blackjack originally to comic book companies and distributors and things like that, I got a great deal of naysayers whose opinions were that there was not really a market for it in the U.S. or that they didn't really, you know, among their, their, their retailers or among their fan base or, or their, their buyer base or, the, you know, whatever, that it would only ap appeal to a small urban niche and that niche would be folks of one particular hue. And that can was we, it. Can we mention the uh, Spike Lee anecdote? Um... Actually, I'm not sure which one you mean. There was there was an adventure of trying to get Spike. Right, but, uh, the, but when we finally yeah. got Spike on board, because I know that we finally, I actually delivered early co copies of that comic book to Spike when he was on a panel um, at a, a J, J, uh, Javits Center uh, convention in New York City as wow, part I forgot about of that. Uh, NBA's All-Star Week. <laughs> So that was an interesting way to uh, get him on wow, that. But yeah. eventually he got on board, and um, 
he was he uh, if I remember correctly and correct me if my uh, memory is uh, uh, faulty here um, the rap he got from um, uh, big movie companies was um, uh, black man can open uh, a film and period pieces don't work and this was at the time when Denzel was opening very well and the mummy was one of the highest grocers and it was the same era and if I remember correctly we were both fairly furious about this <laughs> horse manure <laughs> oh well I mean yeah if I were a more militant kind of person my first comment will be well what do you expect in a you know, racist country but you know, my attitude is I, I've grown up with this this nonsense, um, and most assuredly, as I said, in this is we're talking when we were publishing the book, right. trying to find a film deal. Mm -hmm. But you know, even going back to just trying to get the concept and the book a home with a publisher, this is what I was running into. Right. So you know, it, it, it got ludicrous, and I mean, and, and if we're talking film deals just for a moment. It was, um, in terms of people who got it, people who wanted to see a blackjack film who were established in the film industry. Mike Newell, you know, it was Danny Brasco, Four Weddings and a Funeral, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, it was Spike Lee. It was um, a wonderful, a young writer at the time who was just breaking into Hollywood. He had, he had agents and, and, and a couple of deals floating around. His name is Christ, uh, Christos Gage. And he desperately tried to get a deal for Blackjack. He now is one of the, the one of the great TV writers for like you know Law and Order and stuff like that. Um, there was even um, the, the project was taken to uh, Jerry Jerry. Um, oh, let me get that right now, please, please, please. Uh, uh, Armageddon. He did uh, uh, Bruckheimer. Okay, okay uh, yeah. Bruckheimer's company, and and his people liked it, and they showed it to him, and he went. Yeah, let's let's do it. He was filming Armageddon at the time, and he said, "Yeah, look, but they had a first look." And here's where the doors usually got slammed: it was never the producers, the directors, uh, the actors, or the writers. They they got it. They wanted it to happen. It was always the purse strings, the corporations. So um, uh, several film companies, these these producers and directors had first look deals with several film companies, and it was always a film company who came up with nonsense like that. Yeah, so. Good. Spike, Spike ran into it, and a bunch of other people ran. Black and white didn't matter who presented it. The gatekeepers of the purse usually went, nah, not going to happen. Yeah. And I will say that though Indiana Jones was out before us, and of course Hollywood then immediately cloned their, their various versions of the adventuring hero of the Caucasian persuasion. So you had you know, um, uh, uh, Richard Chamberlain, you know, playing a character, and you had about two or three other uh, movies. You had even Tom Selleck in High Road to China, right. uh, and then you had a number of syndicated TV series uh, with a lot of white folks getting lost in, in strange countries in Africa and Brazil and South America and finding lost tribes of more white folks. So you had all this stuff happening, but you couldn't get Blackjack on because, oh, gee, uh, nostalgia, period piece, or people of color in major positions don't sell. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was that was the attitude at the time. So going all the way back to your original question, um, we did the book. I mean, you were part of the team that, that helped me put that all together. We did the books to the best of our ability. We got the books out, and the books did the work. Right. So, you know, we sold in, we sold through Diamond, we sold uh, at conventions. We sold door to door. Um, the reality was black, white, male, female, young, old, across America, uh, in, in in Mexico, and literally at one point I was able to make this comment from Cairo to Copenhagen. We the issues we put out sold, and and I always like to say where are the brothers hanging out in Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. You know, where's that urban you know niche? Where's Watts or Bed Stuy or Harlem in Copenhagen? <laughs> and and you know, so that that mindset in America was was one hurdle. Once it got out, it was people all over who wanted it would go for it, and the nonsense were the gatekeepers. It it was not really the audience. And anyone who was into adventure, action, thriller, suspense. 
anyone who knew pulp, anyone who knew adventure, any any of those genres, because blackjack covers and, and crosses into all those genres. Those people jumped on and and, right. and they were in they were in a hundred percent, and it continues and, and, today. Yeah, and and at the risk of sounding like I'm patting myself on the back, which I'm not, uh, I'm making a statement that we have made on this show and that I've said a billion times in any class I've ever taught to young creators. You put your best effort forward. You you write the best story you can. You draw the best story you can. You tell the story to the best of your ability. And if you're fortunate, that commitment, that passion, that that focus that you put into it resonates with people and the characters resonate with people and what I like to think happened aside from the fact of all the people who were interested in the genres you mentioned because I think that's one of the things that got them to pick up the book I like to also think that the characters Aaron and the supporting team and the story is what kept them yeah. is is that they were able to identify with or they wanted to follow these characters or this character along on this journey uh, because of the effort we put into creating a solid piece of writing, a solid story, a solid, entertaining, uh, captivating experience. You know, there's that old saying that, you know, maybe something can get you in the door, but then you have to prove it. And, and, and right. that was the case. I, I think it continues to be the case with Blackjack. Whatever gets him in front of an audience... Most of the time, that's all he needs, because you know there's enough uh, a dynamic uh, character there, and um, there's en enough faith that we have. Uh, most importantly, of course, you uh, in the character in the storytelling. Now, I wanted to tie that into Second Bite of the Cobra, mm. uh, because um, it's just been republished, and to tie it into this question, it wasn't an American publisher. Well, um, actually, again, uh, in order, the first republishing of Second Bite of the Cobra was not an American publisher. Who was the that? new one uh, yeah. is is. I mean, this this is uh, this thing I'm holding here right. with the new cover by uh, Scott Hanna. Yay, Scott! Hey, Scott! Hey, Scott! Scott. We're gonna see him. We're gonna see him next week at the signing. Um, this is done by Dover Publication, and they're American-based. Matter of fact, they're here in New York. Fantastic. Uh, but, yeah, but the first reprint of it was done by, uh, and this is an odd name for a company when you when I tell you where it is, uh, Lone Jim Comics. So it's L-O-N-E, Jim Comics, and they are in Holland. Ah, oh, that's right. And that's... right, right. And so what was what was so cool about that for me was. It, it harkened me back to another story, which I'll tell you later. But um, when I got, I was contacted by the publisher, and he was doing some deal with uh, another indie publishing house here in the United States. And he'd come across Blackjack, and he asked me if I could send him a PDF of the story so you could see it. And I did the first storyline. This is recent. You know, this is within the past uh, couple of years. And he got back to me immediately and said, "We'd like to reprint this. Uh, we're a very small company." Uh, we can only pay this, but we really would like to do this, and blah, 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 blah. And I thought, yeah, of course, naturally. Yeah. So uh, we worked out the deal. Um, I sent him uh, files, and they printed the story. And here's the really cool thing. They printed a black and white story first. They printed a short a blackjack story called The Color of Courage. And then they came and did the entire three-issue miniseries of Second Bite of the Cobra. And each issue was printed in Dutch. There you so, go. Nice yeah, translation. Just, yeah, I mean, so I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at my work and my story, and I can't read it. <laughs> <laughs> it's in Dutch. <laughs> and I don't speak it. I don't read it. But it was so cool to sit there and see this work in that, that, that new language, in that language which was new to, to the story for me, you know, that, to experience it that way. And, and to once again hear these, that, that old distant nonsense in my head repeating from those, those bygone days, oh, it will only appeal to, oh, it would only sell in such and such a location. Now it's in a different language. Different language, different country, and it's one of, 
there's, there's another two countries that are interested. And even back when we first started publishing, there were two agents who tried to uh, get it overseas um, for different reasons other than the story, thank goodness, that didn't work out. But one of them, both, both countries were non-black, quote-unquote, countries. So you, you know, a person can't even say, oh, well, of course they wanted it in, in the West Indies or they wanted it in right. Africa. You know, no, I mean, that they wanted the it because they wanted the story, Right. period. You know. Now, let's talk about Dover a little bit. American company, thrilled to talk about that. Um, why do they want to republish? Or republish? Um, yeah, again, not, not being able to speak for them, but being able to say what was said to me. Right. The editor that I work with, uh, Drew uh, Ford, I do hope I have his last name right. Yes, yeah, Drew Ford, uh, approached me uh, middle of last year, and it was almost the same sort of thing. Dover, uh, which normally publishes other types of material, were creating a graphic novel line. And what they really wanted to be able to do was reprint what they felt were some great, I'm quoting, some great classic comic book stories that we hadn't seen for a while and they felt needed to be back out there. That's beautiful. So they, I, mine was one of four or five titles that they wanted to launch this this graphic novel series of theirs with. And so the first one was uh, a sailor on, oh, you know, again, because you're catching me, I didn't realize we were going to talk about this. But a um, quiz. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Deej. Let, let me go home. Let me go home. My dog ate it. Um, uh, they have, you know, I can certainly on our website or on our Facebook page, I can put up the titles of the other books and be proud to. Uh, but the first one came out beautiful, beautiful piece of work. And then uh, later I got the copy of, of Blackjack, uh, Second by the Cobra, and it's quality paper, and it's, it's just pretty to look at. And um, I was fortunate enough to, because they wanted forward and afterward by, by people. So, you know, Joe Iliad wrote um, a, a forward on this. And Where would we know Joe, Joe from? Joe Iliad has been in the comic book industry for, geez, I, I met him back in the 90s. Uh, Joe was an associate editor at DC Comics, working with uh, Denny O'Neill. Mm -hmm. uh, he has he's partners with Sean Martinborough and other people in Verge Entertainment. He has written for several other independent comic book companies. He's got projects of his own out there. He was just out in San Diego on a couple of panels. He's got a um, he's got a blog which I cannot remember the name of, but uh, you know, once again, Joe is in the biz and Joe is business. He's a talented, educated man. He's a lovable human being, uh, but when you invite him to speak about things, he will tell you like it is. He does not mince words. So, so he wrote when, the forward. He wrote the, he wrote the forward, and one of the, you know. And again, I'm you know I'm a, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm mush. Uh, people make a human connection with my work, and it means something like that to them. I I just go jello, and so Joe talked about how his father would have liked this kind of material, and well, how his father tried to introduce him to stuff. And he hadn't gotten it then. He hadn't quite understood it. But now he does. And, and you know, so it's connections in terms of family. And David Colley is uh, an agent in England. And David is one of those, you know, you know, I, I've used the term recently, blackjack knights, as in K-N-I-G-H-T, mm -hmm. you know, S. And David's one of them. He's one of the legion, like yourself. He's one of the legion of people that has worked with me, rode beside me, fought the battles. And David is, is in England and has for 10 years tried to get a video game deal for Blackjack because he believes in the project. He continues to push. And again, it's never the artists. It's never. It's always the, the purse keepers. And so, you know, he's up against it too. But he's done all kinds of other gigs and, and game deals and stuff like that, sports. and that, Not a problem. If I'm playing basketball, football, something like that, and I got dark skin, everybody gets it. You know, but you know, you you change up the game a little bit, and well, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, so, so you know, you know, my, I'm I'm patient in that way that uh, I believe in this, and I'm just going to keep doing what I can with the folks who want to, you know, st stick it out with me. We're just going to keep doing what we can until we get it done, you know, get everything done. And ultimately, it it becomes about the work. So. Let's um, let's use that and some of the stuff that's been said so far to pivot to one of the things that we have promised people, um, mm. you know, and it's time for us to get back to. So we had promised that we would um, 
write some stories for this next anthology and we would get back to them and uh, I think one of the things we can talk about um, is for a couple minutes the process you know um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna hold up the third draft of um, Blackjack Revolt of the Red Star this was a a, um, a a story that's birth was uh, happened here when we were talking about um, expressing emotion and getting emotion out of uh, the writing. And then we turned to Tim, and he was sketching for us. And we mm -hmm. said, "Okay, w you know, draw triumph, and then draw you know uh, failure and that kind of stuff." And the triumph became this great picture of blackjack. Uh, on top of a um, tank waving a flag and you know his challenge was to write the story and I, I asked please please can I grab it because I saw a story right from it so we had read um, a rough draft I guess from the first draft um, a couple of episodes ago and we went back um, I read I'm going to try and share it while you're talking oh, the, the art piece of art that would be great um, there it is Yep. And what is what is uh, the Red Star has uh, been added in, uh, and the Revolt of the Red Star? Uh, those were not part of the episode, so this is the evolution of um, of Tim's thing. Um, and I had asked him to make the buildings um, a little worse for the wear. Um, so we're going to see some of that uh, uh, develop and all that sort of stuff. But um, I had I had worked on um, the draft, and then when we discussed in our pre-production meeting that we would share again, um, I printed it out, and this is the tie-in for the rewrite because as I was practicing reading an excerpt, I'm going to read the beginning again so we can you know kind of measure a little bit of development there. Um, if you can see... Actually, again, I can't, but I'm sure I hope others can, yes. <laughs> uh, once again, the editing process continues. Um, I say to my writing students all the time, you know, I, my first law of writing is let it suck. Just get a, a story on the page. Get a piece of writing on the page or on the screen, let it suck, don't worry about it because it's so much easier to work with the words than the blank screen. So you get it mm -hmm. up there and then you, the rewriting, you know, um, uh, a screenwriting course I took one time, the uh, motto was the secret of writing is rewriting and, and I really believe that. Um, another thing that I teach my students all the time and um, one of my students just texted me. She's down at, um, uh, I have forgotten her college, but she's already taken journalism courses. And everything I, uh, we were teaching, she's being taught now, which is pretty hilarious. Um, but one of the other pieces of advice is to read the work out loud. So mm. when I started to read it today in preparation for, the cla uh, for, for this recording, um, of course, I stumbled on everything that's not working. So you'll hear a lot of the on-the-fly edits and that kind of stuff. So in the interest of fulfilling promises, uh, why don't I read a little bit of the Revolt of the Red Star? Okay. You okay with that? Right. Yeah. You want me to put the image back up while you're reading? Sir? Whatever you want to do is great. Okay. You got it. Whatever Matt wants to do is great. <laughs> He's a, that, who is that man behind the curtain? All right. Egypt, 1937. Five miles outside the once glorious city of Zippa, now known as Aku. The unforgiving sun blazed down on them, the heat undulating up from the blistering sands. And Aaron Day knew something was wrong. Miriam had told him Aku was a town. She had said that word at least three times. What he could see in the near distance was a skyline that promised a city, the telltale mix of architectural styles that the city known in Zeppa 
had grown famous for from the late 1890s through the early 1920s. Miriam never made mistakes, especially not like this. As he raised binoculars, the truth became startlingly clear. Most of Zeppa still existed, at least to some extent. But what was once a gleaming metropolis, rising out of the harsh sands, had been broken. A frequent target of a band of, quote, desert pirates, unquote, as Miriam had called them, had reduced the city, now mostly to rubble. So thorough had these marauders been with their tank attacks that Zeppa had been renamed Aku, which translated to the blessed dead. No matter, Aaron had to get there. Promises to keep. He was a mere two miles away now, but his parched throat and burning skin argued that he still might not make it, and the reason stood stubbornly immobile underneath him. Aaron Day shook the reins, commanding his ride forward. The great white steed ignored the command. Aaron nudged the encouragement with his heels. No movement. Frustration, growling, he took a deep breath and then tried <coughs> sounds. Nothing. It had been this way at random intervals throughout the unnecessarily brutal trip across this scorched desert wasteland and Aaron knew he had only himself to blame. He was assured by the horse trader at the market that this would be a three-hour journey at best. That was before he selected this untamable beast. Hey, Saeed, you do not want that one, I assure you, the horse trader argued. Aaron Day eyed what was clearly the best animal in the stable, a great white steed with fire in its eyes and a proud demeanor. He turned to the local businessman, trying to work him like a tourist. Surprised the man by speaking rudimentary Arabic. I know a thing or two about horses, Asaid, and this is the best you have. No one would doubt your wisdom, sir, but this one's quality comes with a price. Of course it does. Not the price you will barter, Asaid. The price this stubborn horse will exact upon you. I can handle him. Many have said the same thing, I say. And then Al Jin comes loping back from the desert alone, always alone. Not this time. Please do not do this. Aaron held out a considerable amount of money. Take my offer. As you wish, sir. Al Jin proved as demonic as his name suggested. The Barely three-hour ride stretched beyond five, taking them into the roasting midday sun. The delays were always at the animal's whim. This huge white stallion seemed to think Aaron Day was not worthy, and would come to a complete halt whenever he wanted. Damn you, horse! You're going to be the death of both of us! Aaron snarled. The horse snarled back, lifting his top lift, lip and shaking his head in apparent dismissal. Is this a personal thing, or do you reject all riders? The horse whinnied derisively. Oh, me in particular, Aaron growled back. Got it. Then the beast bucked twice, clearly trying to throw Aaron. Not only did the creature fail, but it seemed to sense a change had occurred on his back, because it was the international legend known as Blackjack, who dug his boots into the animal's sides and dug deep. The beast broke into a run, kicking wildly to throw his passenger. Black Jack wasn't having any of that. You want ornery? Now you know how it feels. He gave the horse a kick, snapped the reins, and doubled down on the stallion's sudden charge forward. Yah! Ride full out, you bastard! Al Jin covered the remaining miles at impressive speed, Blackjack let him run full out. Hopefully, it would take a little of the hate out of him. Besides, the sooner he could climb off this demon and fulfill his favor to Miriam, the better. She had contacted him a week ago, asking for help, which shocked Aaron. Miriam never requested anything from anyone, ever. She learned not to, at an early age, from those who should have known better. 
thinking rapists had violated her, almost every member of Miriam's family had turned their back on her. She was forced to set out on her own, too young to be out in the world, too furious to stay where she was not respected. Knowing she had spilled her attacker's blood rather than surrender herself to them, and finding herself considered spoiled despite such heroic efforts, had made her sullen. By the time she and Aaron crossed paths, that fury had honed her skills to become a truly terrifying nightmare for her enemies. Miriam was among the very best warriors he had ever fought alongside. He respected her distance and knew better to ask personal questions, so their friendship grew amid buzzing bullets and whistling swords. Through it all, Miriam never asked so much as a cup of coffee. But this time, the sternly beautiful Egyptian warrior sent a teletype message to his Manhattan apartment, requesting that Aaron assist in keeping a particularly rough army of, quote, 30 well-armed marauders, unquote, away from what she described as the town of Aku. She wrote that these desert tank pirates roamed the region, kidnapping boys to bolster their ranks, raping the girls, killing the rest. She added, local authorities do nothing. He instantly typed back, on my way. Now even that town description fell short of the sweltering reality. He kept the difficult beast at a gallop through the stifling air as he approached what could only be a coup, a former city of destroyed buildings and wrecked streets and blown-out shops and, dominating all else, a stillness that screamed opposition to everything he had ever experienced in a city. There was no sign of life in any direction. Had almost a week of travel been completed too late? Had the marauders come for the remaining citizens? Had he already failed Miriam? Movement at the village's edge. Guards of some kind. Marauders or citizens? Aaron signaled for the horse to slow. Instead, the seed, steed increased speed. You really do want to get us killed, don't you? The beast snorted. Again, just me. Well, at least you're consistent. As they came within a hundred yards, he could see the rhythm of the guard's movements. Hesitant, lacking confidence. Blackjack knew by their small number and disorganization that he was seeing citizens guarding their land, not the marauders. A charging horse could spook them into shooting. That prospect was probably pretty safe. The lack of uniforms suggested they were not yet an army, trained to aim accurately at moving targets. Still, one lucky shot, and they couldn't afford to accidentally kill Blackjack. They needed him, if even, even if they didn't understand it yet. Miriam had explained she needed Blackjack to travel halfway around the world because, while she could get there with firepower she needed to end this, their ransacking of her country, she could not do so before the marauders arrived. She was very specific about her need for him to protect this particular town. That meant she had people here. Now he was charging toward possible death from the people he was here to protect. Fifty yards to go. He leaned forward and shouted into the horrid horse's ear, You throw me, and I'll shoot you dead even as I fall. The beast merely accelerated. Blackjack squinted, watching the movement of the edge at the edge of the ruined city's battered main road, looking for the glint of steel, even as he raised one hand to show he was friendly. The glint came from his left. And it wasn't steel, but iron. And it wasn't fired from a gun. It was thrown like a javelin. And I'll stop there. Okay. Still a lot of work to do. Um... I can still hear some rough edges in it, um, but I'm getting closer to the ideas that um, that I first saw in uh, in Tim's uh, work. You know, well, you know I, 
I, I think, you know, what's, what's kind of cool again is, is inspiration, you know, whether the inspiration comes from some thought, um, say, say <laughs> whether the inspiration comes from some thought or, 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 uh, image in your head or experience you've had, or it comes from a piece of art. Wow. I mean, that was, that was, that was, uh, I could see a lot of the terrain. I could, I could experience um, a lot of the, the, the mood and atmosphere of it. And I particularly liked uh, the relationship <laughs> between Aaron and the horse. Uh, I, I think stubborn animals at times are, are some of the most fun in, in sequences, you know, especially when things are got, about to get down and dirty. Uh, well, you know, one of the challenges with that is be, uh, I don't usually have Aaron talk a lot. Well, and I'm, and we've had conversations about when I do have him talk about, uh, talk at all to scale it back even more. He's a man of few words, but it wasn't like the horse could carry this particular conversation. So yeah, <laughs> it was interesting yeah. to see, um, uh, you know, it was an exercise in pushing, uh, Aaron into, um, uncomfortable or, uh, areas that are not in his wheelhouse. You know, right. and um, I like playing with that idea of there's a very big difference between Aaron Day and Blackjack. Not like an alter ego, not like, you know, he puts the cowl on and becomes, I am the knight! Not like that. <laughs> um, oh, darn, I'm going to take that out of my story. <laughs> <laughs> but But that, you know, that we all have different um, aspects of ourselves. You know, that you we know, call you know, forth. Yeah, you know, it's also funny because um, I've been thinking about this particular aspect um, recently uh, because of some story ideas I've been developing with Aaron. But I didn't think about this back in the day uh, when I first created or when we were first working on that first wave of tales. Uh, one of the, I mean, Aaron, you know, being a soldier, being a, an adventurer, going into uh, dangerous situations and, and, and often having to work by night you know, sneak up on the enemy or whatever, you know, there's a certain amount of covert, you know, stalking and stealth that he is, uh, you know, uh, capable of. But Aaron is really not one to work from behind a mask because right. one of the things that he is doing is putting forth the image that in his era in particularly is rejected. You know, and that is a man of color, of confidence, uh, of strength, of capabilities, of, of education and eloquence. Uh, all of these are things that he is. And to hide that, to mask that behind uh, an alter ego, you know, yeah. would would defeat that. You know, I, I will say that um, just just relate to others. Uh, Howie Chaikin, who I, I had uh, the, the, the pleasure of knowing in the earlier part of his career, uh, you know, did comics for a number of years and did a number of successful things in American Flag and so forth, and went out to Hollywood, as several comic book writers did, and sort of situated himself out there, and wound up working on the original TV series, The Flash, uh, okay. back in the 80s. And he, he was one of the uh, head writers. And I don't know, you know, from behind the curtain exactly how it all came together, but I, knew, I do know that how Howard was was credited with creating, um, I believe the character's name was Nightshade, uh, which was this uh, masked hero that had existed in Central City in the 50s, before The Flash, and The Flash finds out there used to be another masked hero here. And he, you know, he looked a little bit like, the character looked a little bit like the Shadow, but with a, a gas mask kind of uh, doodad on his face. Somewhere and, between <clears throat> the Shadow and the original Sandman. Exactly. And so the, the episode, it's a two-part episode, but the first episode is my favorite because the Flash goes through the process trying to find out who this guy was because, hey, he'll understand what it's like to have this dual identity. And when you find out who the Nightshade had really been and who he is at that point in time, in the Flash's time, you know, I don't want to give it away if people have just bought the box set and <laughs> haven't watched the episode <laughs> yet. It's worth seeing. But, yeah, it, it is. And to me, it was one of those things where uh, I loved that episode so much. And the second part of it, too, was fun that I did something I hadn't done in years. I mean, I hadn't seen Howie in years. But I had to write him. I, I got his 
a Facebook contact information. I wrote him uh, saying, you know, I've now watched this darn thing five or six times. I'm enjoying it immensely. Thank you for doing this because it, it meant a lot to me at that time. And, and I could understand why the character in that particular piece did what he did. But I also understood that in the situation that I'm doing with Aaron, um, you know, it had to be a different way. It had to be, uh, this Aaron is, is all about, you will see me. You will right. see what I can do. You will know who I am. Uh, and, and within the confines and the structure of this society, I exist. I will hold back in some situations. I will, I will, I'm forced to. But there's a limit, you know, but, and, and that's and, it. And what I see, and, and we'll try and wrap it up with this point here, but uh, I want to hear what you have to say about this point. But what I always see with, uh, with Aaron Day Blackjack is that he is a man of confidence, man who has, um, has built his own life and expects a certain level of um, it's interesting I'm not sure because of the time what word would be appropriate um, well say, say what, what comes to mind now and well he insists we'll I, I, I think he insists on um, this is who I am see me as I am but He's above anger and that kind of stuff. We don't see, I don't see, and I might be wrong, but I don't see Aaron De Day snarling and pulling his Colts. When that happens, and it's not like a Hulk thing, it's there's just a different energy than I see when the blackjack side of him takes over. He's just as thoughtful. He's just as, um, there's just as much determination and um, precision, but it's elevated, and most often because he's already being shot at or because, <laughs> you know, whatever is happening, you know. And what I really enjoy about Blackjack is that it's not Bruce Banner, the Hulk. It's not... Um, you know, Clark Kent and Superman. He's always the same guy, you know, but there's there's different levels to him, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's not a berserker. It's not like, you know, Conan's walking through the market and he bites an apple and someone attacks him and he's, ah, by chrome. It's, that's a whole different energy. He's just elevating what he can do. As much as he presents the world to me, it always seems like just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and if he needs to see more, he needs, and I and I try to play that out a little bit with this horse who completely misidentifies him. You know, mm. I guess he was used to people who try to break Broncos or something for a living. You know, and Aaron Day is just well, just he wants the ride. It's not Mort Meek, but he's not he's not forcing it on the horse. But he's well, not I, above I think, that either. When right. you know, when the horse I, I think, is, is trying to fry him, <laughs> right? I, I think I think relationship wise, it's uh, you know human to human. Uh, I would I would look at the relationship, the way it started and how it developed, the relationship between Aaron and Tim Chang, mm -hmm. because Aaron gets Tim Chang as a, as a manservant, butler, whatever you want, through defeating somebody and. Tim Chang was a part of the estate. And so he gets this, this servant, which is for him a first. Uh, you know, okay, so it comes with this and it comes with that. And there's this guy and, all right, he works for me. I, I know what it's like to have people work for me. But I'm not thinking of him as my slave for sure. I'm not thinking of him as inferior. But I'm also not sure I'm not that comfortable with this. And, of course, Tim Chang is not that comfortable and so there's a, there's a certain amount of tension and polite respect, if you will, or polite interactions, but uncomfortable interactions in the beginning of their relationship. They're, 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 in, they're uh, uh, going back and forth. And it's over time that they learn who each other happen to really be. And they determine how they will then 
deal with one another going forward. Um, I, I, I do this again with, you know, this goes back to what I said about characters. Um, I, read, I wrote a piece uh, that involves um, uh, Red from uh, Red and Bo. Red and Bo are two of the mercenaries uh, that what I, Aaron... What, what, if, sorry to interrupt, but what I'd like to do, because uh, we're being told by the man behind the curtain that yeah. we're, we're out of time for this one. So let's leave it on a cliffhanger. It's appropriate for pulps. <laughs> appropriate for pulps. Okay. You, you've you seen us discuss um, the rewriting process and the process of taking um, the essence of a character and expressing it in different levels. And you've seen my efforts for it. Next episode, we see how the master handles oh, geez. The, Handles no pressure. The shades, no pressure. <laughs> the shades of red in blackjack. Oh, oh, that's dude, terrible. Dude. You'll get and, to and see how the master tells the damn story. <laughs> you want to hear more about the show or any of us? Go to tellthedamnstory.com. Okay. So let's 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 make this next episode, you know, a taste of the master. God, I, I don't actually feel like you. No Matthew, pressure, how do you like, like that no one? Pressure. You like you like <laughs> face of the master, the master stroke. 